and uh, doing a great job. We're not going to let him quit. Uh, he's doing, uh, doing too great here. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And I thank you for being here and during the heat. And uh, if you'll direct your attention to the video screen, Jumbotron. Thank you. I'm a forward air controller, a fact, an Air Force pilot assigned to brigade. This particular mission was pre-planned, requested by the Army's 3rd Brigade a day in advance. The objective was to find and destroy base camps on an east-west BC supply route in the area around Lai about 50 miles from Saigon. In 1947, the U.S. Army issued a call for a new all-metal two-place utility aircraft for battlefield reconnaissance and liaison. Cessna Aircraft Company modified its popular Cessna 170 to create the Cessna Model 305A. Instead of four seats, the 305A had two seats in tandem. Its side windows were angled to improve the view below. Windows were installed over the pilot's head and the rear fuselage was redesigned to allow a view directly behind. The Army ordered 418 Model 305s, designated as the L-19 Bird Dog. Deliveries began in December 1950, and bird dogs were soon at work in the Korean War. The Marine Corps also used Cessna Bird Dogs, designated O-1, for observation. Cessna eventually produced 3,400 L-1901s. The name Bird Dog was suggested by a Cessna employee. The purpose of the L-1 was to find the enemy and orbit its location until artillery and attack planes could deliver the goods and then hang around to observe the hits and report the results, somewhat like the role of a gun dog used by hunters. During the Vietnam War, bird dogs were used mainly for reconnaissance, artillery spotting, radio relay, convoy escort, and forward air control. The job of the forward air controller, FAC for short, was to locate the enemy with help from the troops on the ground, mark a target with rockets, and vector the fast movers, the fighters and the bombers, into their attack. It was risky business, but the rule was the fighters could not drop a single bomb without directions from a FAC. So the FACs were essential to providing air support for troops on the ground. It was dangerous work and the casualty rate was high among bird dog FACs. While the L-19 was gradually replaced by the faster twin-engine O-2 Skymaster and OV-10 Bronco, Cessna L-19s and O-1s served throughout the Vietnam War with 469 bird dogs lost to all causes. When the war ended, most of the L-19 and O-1 aircraft used in Vietnam were left there. A few found their way to Thailand and Australia. In the late 1940s, the United States Air Force wanted a new aircraft to replace the North American T-6 Texan. The T-6 was a solid, capable airplane that had trained tens of thousands of Allied pilots in World War II. 
but it was 1930s technology. Development of military aircraft was moving rapidly into the jet age, and the T-6 was looking rather long in the tooth. The Air Force wanted a new two-place advanced trainer aircraft that would be more powerful than the T-6 and easier to maintain. It had to be capable of operating from an aircraft carrier and it had to be weapon ready, easily adapted for an attack role. It had to prepare pilot trainees for the newer, high-performance combat and utility airplanes that were taking over frontline duties. and it had to be rugged enough to withstand student pilots' inevitable mistakes. North American Aviation Company had designed and built the T-6 in 1935, and again the company presented a winner in the competition to build the new trainer aircraft. Its T-28 met the requirements, and unlike the T-6, it had a tricycle landing gear like the jets and other high-performance aircraft the military was adopting. Once the Air Force chose the T-28, the Navy and Marines quickly followed, and the airplane entered service in 1950. Between 1950 and 1957, North American built 1,948 T-28s. Besides the U.S., T-28s would eventually be operated by 27 foreign countries in Africa, Asia, South America, both as trainer and in combat roles. In 1963, a Royal Lao Air Force pilot defected to North Vietnam and his T-28 became the first fighter aircraft of the North Vietnamese Air Force. In the Vietnam War, T-28s were flown by U.S. and South Vietnamese Air Forces for reconnaissance and forward air control, and as attack planes for close air support of ground troops. L-19s and T-28s also played leading roles in separate top-secret programs in Vietnam, but that is another story. All right, Ed, sure. go ahead, grab a seat there. All right. Bring sir. Phil, you can take the next one. Then we'll give Alan and Yang Chi the last two. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed McElhinney. I'll be the moderator for the program this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. I'm happy to say that we've got a little uh, overcast uh, to keep things a little cooler, which is a very good thing. I'm looking forward to uh, today's program. Um, it should be very interesting. Uh, we've got several people here with uh, combat time, and uh, I'll introduce each one of them individually. The first guy we got here is Ed Fairchild. Uh, he is one of the 01 kind of guys, and uh, flew in Vietnam, uh, what, 1,000 hours or so, something like that, uh, flying time, is that right? I'm sorry? 1,000 uh, hours of uh, 01 time, somewhere along there? 985 hours, okay. 566 missions. All right, ni 985 hours of combat time, okay? Uh, the next guy, we got Phil Phillips over there. Um, we can't talk about his mission. I'm sorry. We're just going to shut him up. No. He was a sneaky peek kind of guy. And uh, he also has, uh, I don't know, around 1,000 hours of combat time in the old one. A little less, but okay. uh, kind of lost count. So between the two of them, we got almost 2,000 hours of combat time in an O1, one uh, in, well, L-19. Um, next guy is our T-28 expert, uh, Alan Cook. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about the airplane and all that. But, and you're, you're kind of going, okay, wh why, what, what's going on here? We got an O-1 and we've got, hey, a T-28. Well, and that's where the Hmong come in. And yeah, Yang Chi, uh, I'll let uh, Alan introduce Yang Chi. Go ahead. So Yang Chi is one of our board members from the National Lao Hmong Memorial Foundation. 
and he's here to speak to the how, the involvement of the Hmong in the in the war. Okay, and and we're gonna have like like three separate uh, little portions here. Uh, we're gonna get Ed to talk a little bit about his flying in the O one, which was. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying yours was illegitimate, but it was. <laughs> it was somewhere else. It was legitimate flying in the O one in, uh, in in Vietnam, and and he'll talk to his support um, of the uh, Arvin Airborne. Uh, next, we're going to get into uh, to Phil and what they did. And it's not classified anymore, but everybody at this point should realize that you know, yeah, the war was Vietnam, but oh, there was something else going on over there, and it was in Laos and Cambodia. And, uh, and it was, uh, you know, this morning we talked about the, uh, the, the forgotten war, as in Korea, okay? And, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the secret war and the secret war that went on in Laos and Cambodia. And Phil was, uh, was one of the guys who did that. And so he'll be able to speak to that, uh, that classified mission at that time and what he did there. Um, and part of that and the follow-on after that, of course, was, hey, the T-28 and what those guys did over there, which to me was just absolutely incredible. Some of the missions they flew, the number of missions per day, the, n the total number of missions, um, absolutely. Uh, what, what was the motto? Fly until you die, yep. you know, and that's what they did, and that was for their country. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up to, uh, to Ed, and he's going to talk a little bit about Hey, and, and at the end, by the way, we'll do a quick walk around on each airplane, and then we'll have some questions that uh, y'all can ask after that. But, uh, but for right now, I'm just going to ask Ed just to briefly describe where he flew the O-1 and, and some of the details on his missions that he had there. So, Ed, you got it. All right, I'm Ed Fairchild, and I flew for the United States Air Force. I uh, flew L-19s in uh, South Vietnam. I uh, got over there by a slightly different route. I did a bunch of time in B-52s as a navigator, went through pilot training, ended up in a L-19 flying forward air controller for the Vietnamese Airborne Division. And so what that really means is simply this. Wherever the Airborne went, uh, that's where we went. And whatever they needed in the way of air support or artillery support, we provided that. We adjusted the guns uh, for artillery uh, uh, input, and then we also would handle the airstrike. On the airstrike, we'd have three radios in the airplane. Uh, UHF, we were working the fighters on that one. The VHF is what we use for the control of other fighters coming in. And then we would have talking on a FM radio when you're talking with the folks on the ground. So they would give us a mark so we know about where it is that we're working and what our objective is. We check in with our senior person on the red markers um, and the red hats. Red hats were the ground advisors with the uh, Airborne Division. And uh, the, uh, Vietnam only had that one Airborne Division, and so it was used in a special forces uh, arrangement such that Wherever in the country there was a real active engagement with the enemy, uh, they would have uh, ex the excess help they had was coming from the airborne troops. So we would sometimes you're working in the northern part of Vietnam, sometimes you're working in the southern part. So it just depended on who needed what and where and when. And uh, so you would then uh, fly in direct support with those folks. Uh, when I first got over there, I was working out of a rubber plantation with the Australians on a combined operation with the Vietnamese Airborne, the Australian troops, and also the U.S. troops. We spent a couple months working that, and uh, the primary advisor I was talking with was Red Hat 1-1. So uh, these guys, when you first got over there, they wanted to set up a personal relationship between you and them. They wanted us to know their wives' name, the children, so that when we were working with those folks on the ground, it was not a disengagement uh, with the people. It was, it was your friend on the ground, and now you had a personal relationship with those folks. So they worked hard at, at setting that relationship up, and quite correctly so. And uh, so I... I was complaining about the artillery shooting at me uh, most of the time, so um, 
I, uh, you know, if the, if the artillery is coming in, it's coming down from somewhere, and if I'm in the middle, it's coming past me, and that's not real nice some days. So you want to make sure you know where things are. And so he was uh, razzing me a little bit, telling me that he could come down and walk around in the jungle with him. Well, I wasn't going to do that, but I volunteered to take him for a flight. And so a few months later, we, we uh, got together, and uh, I ended up taking him up a bunch of times. He ended up going to the Army Aviation Corps. He said, I'm not walking around that jungle anymore. <laughs> so, Smart man. So uh, there was a real tight relationship between the Vietnamese Airborne. They were good people, um, both officer and enlisted folks. They were great folks, and uh, they did a good job. What kind, of, what kind of ordinance were you using? Uh, what, what were you shooting? What were you dropping? Uh, what was it? You know, well, was it? I, I was armed with uh, 2.75 inch uh, smoke rockets. I had four on each wing. This uh, airplane you see has got two. And then we also had a row of flares, uh, actually smoke grenades that were on the back of the seat. And so when you run out of rockets, you reach back and grab one of those grenades. and You put it in your left hand and you stuck it out the window. It did not come back in the airplane. <laughs> did you carry a rifle with you too? Yeah, we carried an AR-15, we carried a pistol, and a knife or two just for good measure. <laughs> and, uh, but you never used those in flight, you didn't need that. You had all kinds of, of stuff uh, that you needed to shoot the enemy with and you needed to control that. Very intense environment in the, in the fight area when you're airborne in there with the fighters running around and yourself, and then you got uh, the intersection of all these airplanes and you got a lot of information flowing between things. So it's very difficult and time consuming to do it correctly in the cockpit. Absolutely mandatory that you do that. You kill people if you don't. And so at any rate, I ended up flying with those guys for um, about nine months out of the 12 months I was over there and I uh, flew uh, as a sector uh, ALO for a little while. Um, and learned how to really appreciate the support, the ground support that was provided by the Arvin. Because uh, when you're out in the sector, it was all yours. At one point, I had three airplanes, three pilots, myself, and 30 minutes worth of gas to support a whole division. So we had to build our own f uh, refueling facility. Um, at any rate, when I was with the Royal Red Markers, uh, then we got all that support taken care of. And uh, so I ended up flying 566 missions, and I never took a single round in the airplane. Okay, and in saying that, um, you had specific techniques to being uh, missed, uh, to avoid being hit. Um, you described some of your rolling techniques. Yeah, uh, well. That, uh, you know, if, if you saw a target down there, and you said, okay, I need to mark that target. Uh, what, what was your, your most successful technique to not being shot? Okay, well, first of all, if, you, if, they didn't, if the enemy on the ground didn't, under, didn't know that, they shoot you, shoot at you when they think that you know where they are. If, you, if they think you don't know where they are, they're not going to bother you. Okay, but once you put that mark on the ground for the fighters, uh, the game is up, and now they're going to, you become the number one target because if uh, they get you, if they get me, fighters can't drop, so I become the primary person they want to shoot at. So what you want to do is you don't want to ever do the same thing two times in a row. You always want to do something different, and it's also a bit good if you do it very badly. So you become, when you do it badly, you become unpredictable. And that's what you want because that allows you to maneuver and not catch any ground fire hit. So one of the real classic maneuvers that you would do is, uh, it was really easy to do, uh, but it was extremely flexible. You would think you were just going to shoot a rocket. You just want to ease over there and take a shot. At it. Uh, that's not really the right way to do it. That's the way you get killed. So what you do is you pull the airplane up a little bit, bleed off airspeed and energy, and now you got 4.4 positive G that you can pull in that airplane, and you got a 1.7 negative G, and so you just stick that airplane up there like this, pull the throttles back, the airspeed's dying, and you're losing energy, and now you're up here, 
and you can do four things in a heartbeat, less than two seconds, and you're doing it. You can pull and shoot. You can pull through and shoot back. You can pull over here, kick a little rudder, and slide this way, and vice versa over here. And you do any one of those four in two seconds. So now you can see that you've become totally unpredictable. And so you don't even want to do that on a consistent basis. Do something else. Do anything, but don't be predictable and don't do the same thing two times in a row. How long was a typical mission for you? Uh, typically, you run a couple hours because the problem that you get into is that even if you, were, uh, you find the enemy and you want to do, uh, put an airstrike on them, if you're over a couple hours, then you don't have enough gas to stay there and take care of the engagement. So you were constantly wanting to be to the point to where you could stay for a while. The longest mission I flew was um, f about uh, four different sorties in one day for a total of about eight, eight and a half hours. Uh, you could hold a lot of rudder pressure with your legs, so after the first couple of hours, you, uh, you need to get some some more gas and you need you know, more uh, rockets and smoke grenades. So you stick it on the ground, uh, walk around a little bit, climb back in the airplane. Ten minutes later, they got it all rearmed, refueled, and you're out again. And I did that all day long. Um, we captured, uh, we actually kept the enemy from getting into its sanctuary over in Cambodia. And that gave us a chance then to... Uh, really put some stuff, tough stuff down on those guys. Uh, at the end of the eight hours, uh, we got credit for 191 uh, KIA, so they're killed by air. And uh, so that was the longest uh, day I flew. You said you never got any bullet holes in your airplane, but did the airplane ever fail you? Did you well, one of the weak points in that one was, oh, it was the engine. It wasn't the airframe or anything because you could have, like I say, a stress for 4.4 positive G. So, yeah, that wasn't the issue then. Sometimes the engine, uh, you had some trouble there. We have an airplane down in Fort Worth that we're rehabbing, and it's got the same tail number that tried to kill me about four or five times. <laughs> and so uh, what it was doing, you'd be flying along, and all of a sudden it's not running. Uh, you lose an altitude, the engine's not running right, it's missing, uh, and so forth and so on. And about 40 or 50 feet above the trees, that dumb thing would start going, mm, you just fly right out of there. And uh, I got a little tired of that because I was the only person it was doing it with. So at that point, I probably had 350 missions or so, whatever it was. And uh, other pilots I was flying with were starting to treat me like maybe I had a yellow streak in the wrong spot. And so you know, they, don't, they, they quit talking to you. They won't have anything to do with you. And uh, finally, one day, one of the other pilots uh, had the same trouble. And he came back. He was really upset about that. And uh, so uh, they finally got him calmed down a little bit. And they were talking to him. They asked him what the problem was. And he said this. This was a quote. He says, exactly what Fairchild said. And all, all of a sudden, I had credibility again, which is nice to have. And, uh, and then all the pilots refused to that, fly that airplane. So the way we got rid of that airplane was the crew chief took it in his hands. And he got up on top of the Cali one day and I was taxiing in on another airplane. And uh, he looked like he was up there wrapping a couple of things together. So I shut my airplane down, walked over and talked to him for a second. And I asked him what he's doing up there, and he said, well, he says, oh, I can't fix this thing. I'll just tear it up. So he was grinding up a nail and putting it in the oil and uh, chained the airplane down and run the engine until he ruined the engine and they got a new one. And, you know, we quit having troubles, and that airplane and everything worked well. Uh, I was out one day also in another different airplane, and that one, uh, it uh, had a... Uh, we had a engine malfunction in the sense that a valve keeper came off. We had six cylinders in that engine, and two of them were ruined, and so I'm ruining on four. And uh, it's got severe vibration. I'm doing really good to hold altitude about oh, 40, 50 feet above the trees. And so if uh, 
big tall tree came, he just kind of arranged the wing up a little bit and let it slide past. And uh, so I was getting, the, I got back to the airfield. As soon as I retarded the, air, uh, the engine just the least little bit, it quit. So I ended up having to dead stick the airplane out on the ground. So engine problems were the real okay. Uh, okay. weak point in that in the airframe. All right, we're going to move on to the uh, the the portion of the program that we can't talk about, and uh, and that's the sneaky Pete guys, and that's Phil, and uh, <clears throat> Phil was involved in the. Uh, the war, I guess we can't, well, I don't know what, what you, I'll, I'll leave it to you. What, what did we call that conflict over there? Or could we call it anything? But he didn't operate in Vietnam, from what I understand. He operated west of there. And so I'll turn it over to Phil and give him a quick, uh, let him give a quick synopsis of what went on over there. Sneaky Pete, it was what, the Sneaky Pete Air Force, isn't that? Yeah, that was the, uh, the acronym they used. And, uh, and he was one of them. And yeah, it was classified for a long time. So, Phil, describe it. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today to learn a little bit about the history of, of, of uh, the war and what we were doing and so on. I'll give you a little background and then we'll talk about Sneaky Pete's. Um, I graduated from flight school in 1969 as an Army aviator, went to jungle survival school in the Philippines, and then was deployed to Vietnam and was assigned to the 219th Aviation Company. If you'll notice my tail number, is 219th. So um, I have a lot of sentiment toward that particular airplane and that unit. And just so you know, there are three other gentlemen that are sitting in the bleachers here who were in my unit. And I'm going to introduce them quickly, and then I will tell you a little bit more about one of them. Uh, first one is Frank Dowdy. Frank, stand up, say hi. And, and, then, and then we've got Jerry over here. He was with the 219th Aviation Company also. And then we got Rod Stewart back here. He was, he was a headhunter as well. And on my shirt, you'll see, you'll see two call signs. One of them is the headhunter with the, with the headhunter logo. And the other one says SPAF. And I'll tell you a, a little bit more about that. Now, my buddy Frank Dougherty, Frank and I shared a hooch. Uh, on the CCC compound, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, um, a Special Forces compound in comp Contum. And Frank has written a book uh, called Only the Light Moves. It, it's, uh, you can pre-order it on Amazon, and it's specifically about the SPAF mission in uh, Laos and Cambodia, what we did and how we supported the, uh, uh, the command and control central operation. And uh, I didn't fly many missions in Vietnam. I was, I was assigned to the 219th uh, my whole tour there. Uh, and so I flew for the 3rd Platoon for, I don't know, three weeks or so. It was kind of boring, to be honest with you. Convoy, convoy escorts and uh, artillery adjustment, registering batteries and looking for stuff that was kind of hard to find. So I wanted something a little bit more interesting. So. I, uh, I asked to be assigned to the second platoon up in uh, Contum, and so for the first month or so, I flew for uh, uh, MAC V, and what that means that was the Military Advisory Command Vietnam, MAC V. You've heard about that, and uh, that was a more interesting job. And then I met a guy by the name of John Myers, who was a SPAF pilot. And uh, he was a member of my platoon, and he says, you know, why don't, why don't you come over and fly our mission? Uh, a couple of our pilots are rotating home pretty soon, and uh, we, need, we need a volunteer. We need a volunteer to fly the mission. And as, as it turns out, every person uh, that was uh, working with Command and Control Central, which was uh, Mac B. SOG, uh, Military Advisory Command Vietnam S uh, Studies and Observation Group, Special Forces. All of the members of MACV SOG, all of them, were volunteers, including the uh, aviators that supported them. And so we lived on their compound across the river, uh, across the Doc Blah River in Contum, and uh, we, flew, uh, we flew for them every day. And uh, Frank and I flew uh, missions together, and uh, 
dual ship missions and sometimes single ship missions. And uh, um, we had several types of missions that we flew. And, and as Ed said earlier, uh, the, uh, the mission was top secret. You had to volunteer for it. You had to sign the form that you couldn't talk about it. If you did, you would uh, have an early trip home to uh, some nice place like Leavenworth. So um, all, of the, uh, all of the Mac VSAW guys were volunteers. And if you were, if you were a ground pounder, if you were a te on a, on a uh, spook team, so to speak, a uh, sneaky Pete team, uh, they briefed you that you had one of two things would happen to you. You would either get a purple heart or you would come home in a body bag. Every member, every member of the SOG teams uh, on the compound that I lived on, every one of them got a purple heart at least once. Several of them were killed. And, and uh, while I was there, there were two Medal of Honor winners living on our compound. And it was, it was an honor to serve with them. Uh, and like, uh, like Ed said a while ago, you got to know the team, you got to know the uh, Americans that were uh, the team leaders. And a, t a team would be two Americans and uh, maybe eight or nine Montagnard fighters. And they were, they were the natives, they were the native hill people. They were wonderful fighters, loyal. And so now we'll get more into, into the aviation side of it. Uh, as as uh, all of the guys that worked on the ground, they were called Sneaky Pete's, the Special Forces guys. So naturally they gave us a call sign of Sneaky Pete Air Force. Well, we weren't Air Force, we were Army bird dog pilots. And the, the aircraft that I flew over there, there were several of them, they looked exactly like the one you see uh, sitting next to us here. And that's his airplane, by the way. That is his airplane. He and that's, that's my airplane. It belongs to my lo me and my lovely wife, already sitting up there in the stands. And uh, we restored, bought it in 1986, restored it in 87, put it back in my unit colors. It's pretty authentic, so after the program, you're invited to come down and take a look at them. And the name of it? It's Saigon T. Okay. Is there okay. okay, so there's an interesting question. How many Vietnam veterans do we have in the audience today? Okay, we've got a few. So you know what Saigon T is, right? So if you, if you were an American soldier in Vietnam and you wanted to go, go into town and maybe have a couple of adult beverages with a, uh, at a bar and meet a bar gal or something like that to have a conversation with, um, you, would, you would buy whiskey and you would pay for whiskey and you would drink the whiskey. And if the gal wanted a beverage, you would buy her a beverage, but it was tea. But you paid for it as if it were whiskey. And so that, was, that beverage was called Saigon Tea. So when I was searching for a name for this particular aircraft, I wanted to uh, give it a name that would identify it with service in Vietnam. Except this airplane never saw service in Vietnam. Um, most of the, almost all of the airplanes that served in Vietnam, the, bur the bird dogs, the 01 bird dogs, uh, they did not come home. This doesn't mean they all got shot down or anything, but they were not, econo it was not economically um, cost effective to crate them and ship them home. So we left them there. And they became pots and pans for the Vietnamese people, and what it, and the, and the North Vietnamese got a hold of a few of them, and continued to use them. But I put my airplane back into my unit colors, and since it's not the real deal, it's not real whiskey, I called it Saigon Tea, and and it, it has worked, and uh, my wife and I are very proud of it, and uh, we fly it frequently. And uh, it's been a super reliable, fun airplane to fly. All right, back to the flying now. All right. So uh, we did not uh, measure our uh, missions by sorties um, like the Air Force guys did. We just, we just flew our missions, and, we, and the hours were logged. And uh, I never kept track. I didn't keep a journal. I, I didn't even keep a logbook when I was over there because of the nature of the mission was secret. And uh, 
uh, I uh, didn't even keep letters, uh, you know, back and forth to my wife and so on. We, we destroyed that kind of stuff. But we flew um, in Laos and Cambodia every day. We, we uh, normally flew two missions a day. The missions could last two hours, three hours, four hours, or longer. We carry 40, 40 gallons of fuel in the aircraft, burn eight gallons an hour. So we have four and a half hours to fly a mission and 30 minutes to get home. And uh, twice on final approach into Khantoum coming home, I have run out of fuel. Because when you have troops on the ground that are in trouble, you stay with them until you get them extracted and you know they're safe, and then you come back. And, and uh, I, did, I did run out of gas twice on final approach. And I'll make a little side comment here because uh, Ed was talking about the engine that was running rough and the maintenance and so on. I never had an engine failure. Uh, in fact, the only engine problems I ever had would be a mag drop, you know, on run-up or something like that. And our crew chiefs over there and our maintenance people were so good and so dedicated. They knew the importance of what we were doing, and they, they worked. They were at the flight line before we got there in the morning, and when we finished our mission and were drinking beer, they were still working on the airplanes in the afternoon. So my hat is off to them. Frank and the headhunters will, will agree to that. <laughs> so we norm normally flew a couple of missions a day. We were based in Khantoum. We would take off at dawn, and we would uh, head up to a staging field northwest of Khantoum called Dock. Tow, and uh, and uh, we would uh, take on a little more fuel there, and there was a CCC little secret uh, mini base there at the Dock Tow Airport where the operations officer would uh, give us our mission or change our mission or, or whatever, and then uh, if we were flying recon missions without an observer, we would just take off into Laos or Cambodia. And our job was to recon the Ho Chi Minh Trail and areas around it. Now, our, I don't know, our AO, was our area of operation, was probably uh, less than 100 miles square in the tri-board area, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So we got to know that area pretty well. And we were either reconning out there, looking for stuff, target, targets of opportunity, or whatever. The other thing we did is we would find landing zones to insert the special forces teams, and then we would mark those landing zones with uh, with the white phosphorus markets when the special forces teams were in the Hueys and in the air. And sometimes we would mark the real landing zone, and sometimes we would mark a fake landing zone, because the LZs over there in the in the boonies they had LZ watchers out there. And they were either sitting up in the canopy on a deer stand with their binoculars or they were in bunkers along the edge of the LZ waiting for helicopters to come in so they could shoot at them. And so our job was to insert, was to, to mark the LZs, to bring the, to bring the teams in, and we normally had a Cobra Escort or Charlie model gunships, uh, Hueys, and we would put, put the teams in. Normally two helicopters would land the teams would jump off, disappear into the jungle, and then we'd go back to Dock Tow and wait for the next thing to do. Uh, we also did photo missions, low-level photo missions. And when I say low-level, I'm talking 10 to 50 feet off the ground because we had to see under the canopy. We had to be able to look under the canopy to see if we could find hooches, uh, uh, truck parks, POL, uh, fuel stops for the enemy. As, you, as all of you know, the enemy came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was inside Laos and Cambodia. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was not in Vietnam. But there were probably 50 different places between the uh, Mujia Pass and, and the Parrot's Beak where, the, uh, where the, uh, the North Vietnamese would come into South Vietnam to bring in their troops. They normally moved at night. So we did not really fly night missions. There were other uh, Air Force assets that flew the night missions. Um, so for us, for the Army guys, we had to find our targets in the daylight, which was very hard. 
So when you knew your area of operation and you knew the trail, which, by the way, was not one road. It was a network of roads and trails and paths and rivers and bridges you know, from, south, from north to south. And uh, the North Vietnamese were very resourceful. I mean, you could find a bridge, a bamboo bridge that they moved troops down the night before. You could call in an airstrike on it, blow it up, and go back the next day, and it would be there again. All fresh new bamboo. And their, their anti-aircraft sites, they had a lot of them out there, um, and they would uh, camouflage them with netting, or they would have these uh, square grids made out of bamboo and weave the uh, foliage in them and place them over the gun sites so you couldn't see them. And uh, talking about, uh, you know, getting shot at, uh, Ed was right. You know, as a sneaky pea pilot, we had various techniques for not getting shot at. And that was we'd usually pretend not to see the target when we flew over it. We'd mark it on the coordinates, and if it was a good target of opportunity, we would pass it, uh, contact the operations officer at uh, Doc Toe, get Cobra's launch, because as Army pilots, we could not directly call up uh, Air Force fighters. We had to go through an Air Force forward air controller, a FAC, to do that. And in our neighborhood, we used Cubbies, and they were flying O2s. And uh, if we were a little further north, we might use nails. And they came out of Nakam Phnom in Thailand, or they came out of Da Nang. They were flying, they were flying OV-10s. But anyway, as Ed said earlier, you find it, you find a target, you get your, you get your helicopters launched, and then the idea is to get over the target and mark it, and hit the target, and uh, with white phosphorus marking rockets, which is what you see under the wings here. And then the helicopter gunships would come in and use their, uh, use their uh, rockets and mini guns and their, their, grenade, their grenade launchers out of their chin, chin guns uh, to obli obliterate the target. If we needed Air Force assets, uh, we would call up the Covey. They would tell us what they had nearby, which was usually F-4s or, uh, or um, uh, F-100s. Or if they were coming out of Thailand, we had the, um, we had the um, AD-4 Sky Raiders. And by the way, there are two of them out there on the ramp, AD-4s, in the exact color of the aircraft that we worked. And uh, we had a pretty good relationship with the FAC pilots. Um, we would communicate with them on the VHF radio. They would tell us what the jets are carrying, which would usually be napalm, bombs, uh, and guns, machine guns of some caliber. And the, uh, the uh, 84s would have napalm and bombs, and they would also carry cluster bomb units, which were in tubes. They were like hand grenades in tubes, and they could drop them, and these hand grenades would fall out and burst in the air a few feet above the ground, and they were really effective at obliterating troops on the ground. And... Uh, you know, I did not get shot at a lot uh, because we were sneaky peeps after all. You know, that was what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to not get shot at. But, uh, you know, I think in my whole tour I might have taken five or six rounds in the aircraft. And if you, you'll, look at, you'll look at my Harley Davidson decals on this aircraft, you'll kind of see where a couple of them went through and uh, missed me and my observer. And... Uh, and so most of the time, most of the time we got home with a couple of stories to tell, and uh, then afterward a few cold beers. And uh, later on during the during our operations, as the Vietnam War was kind of starting to spool down, and Frank will attest to this, the CCC mission, the SOG mission, was spooling up because of the bombing ha halt and so on. The North Vietnamese were busy moving supplies and building more AA sites. And so we had to be super careful about, uh, about what we were doing. Now, once we, had troop, once we had teams on the ground, one of our other missions was to communicate with them daily to make sure they were still out there, still alive, and, and, and track their movements so we knew what was going on. And the, team, the teams 
they were also sneaky Pete's, and their job was not to get shot at and not to engage in combat. But occasionally they would, and sometimes the teams would have to be extracted. And this is when things got exciting, because when the team called for a spare three-niner, which was code for extraction, they would, they would call me, and they would, they would not use the code wheel that we used. We used a, a code wheel to, to talk to each other because we didn't want to talk in English a lot of times. And they, they would come right out and say, we need a spare three-niner now. And so I'd get the, I'd get the Hueys launched from uh, 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 Docto and get the Cobras launched, hopefully get approval from the operations o uh, officer on site there to pull the team out. Occasionally, he'd be a jerk and say, tell the team to break contact, continue mission. The teams did not like to hear that. <laughs> um, but occasionally, they had to break contact, continue mission. But uh, usually, the operation officer, um, the S3, would listen to the SPAF pilot. And if the team needed to come out, it's because usually they were being chased, surrounded, already had wounded. And our job was to go in with the helicopters and get them out. And so if they were being chased, the enemy was close at hand. And uh, we would have to bring in gunships to uh, pepper the area around the team. Sometimes we'd bring in jets. Usually I like to work the Sky Raiders because they would come in low and slow and they had more loiter time. And there were times, and Frank would attest to this, when we would, when we would have the uh, Sky Raiders dropping ordnance danger close. And I'm talking about 50 yards or less from our teams on the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would just tell them, crawl under, crawl under a log, get behind a tree, something, because we're coming in danger close. And they would ask us to come in danger close because sometimes the enemy was that close. And if, we were, if they were dropping napalm, we would tell them, hold your breath, guys, because you're not going to be able to breathe when the, when the air is sucked out by, by the napalm. And then after they made their napalm runs, they would drop bombs, and then they would come in with their guns. And uh, when, the, when things got quiet, the helicopters would land. But I'll tell you, folks, it did not take the enemy long to uh, regroup. And by the time the helicopters landed, excuse my French, the enemy was pissed. And that's, that was the most dangerous time for us as SPAFs and for the helicopter pilots. And my hat is off to those guys. I watched those guys come in and hover sometimes 10 feet over a poor LZ. And you could see the tracers going through the helicopters. And those Special Forces guys climbing up the rope ladders, getting in there, and those helicopters did not move an inch. And uh, we'd, get, we'd get them out, and, and uh, the helicopters would leave. And uh, the, fortunately, the enemy, well, I don't say fortunately, but usually they were focused on the helicopters more than they were the bird dogs. But once the helicopters dd out, so to speak, uh, they would start shooting at us. And you could see the tracers going by, and you could hear the reports of the rifles. And uh, usually we escaped along with the helicopters, and then uh, life was good. All right. Thank you, Phil. Um, I think uh, we got to go to the third portion of our program, which is the T-28. And uh, Yang Chi, I think, is going to be the guy to, to talk to us about those, those patriots of yours that flew these airplanes and fought with these airplanes and uh, put in some incredible time. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I read briefly about, I mean, they were flying sometimes 10 missions a day. Um, I, I, I can't even consider how many hours that must be uh, and the amount of ordnance they delivered. But Yang Chi, go ahead, talk a little bit about, uh, right. and th these right. are the Hmong people. Uh, and, and go ahead, you're on. I just want to say that I want to thank you all. As I look through all of you here, I want to thank you again for your interest in knowing the history of the secret war in Laos. I want to thank Phil, right, Phil? He has given you the histories of the operations 
in that part of the world similar to what the Hmong did. So I'm not going to go through that again because exactly what, what we're saying was what we were doing in Laos. During the United States Secret War in Laos. The United States Secret War began officially from 1961 to 73, but unofficially before that. It was way before that. From General Eisenhower or President Eisenhower all the way to President Kennedy, and then all the way to President Nixon down to Ford, caught through all this. But anyway, I want you to know that the Secret War was a un it was the United States Secret War in the 20th century in the country of Laos, while the war in Vietnam was going on. The Secret War was kept, or had been kept, secret for 35 years. And many of you, as I said earlier, as I look through this, uh, the audience here, I respect you all, those who served during that war. It was a secret war because the whole thing there began with global interest between superpower countries. Global interest between communism and capitalism. So as the war started way in back in 1960, 61, all the way down there when the war was going on in South Vietnam, President Kennedy ordered the CIAs to take charge. That's why we began with the United States Secret War in Laos. The Hmong, particularly the ethnic groups in Laos, with a total population ethnically for like 350,000 out of a population of nation population of 3.5 million people in Laos. But the Hmong were the first one who were chosen, selected by the U.S. government, the CIAs and the government. Anyway, I want to call those who are lucky enough to be here in our country. And I'm saying here, I'm standing here and saying this because we appreciate what we have done for the country of Laos and also for the country of America, this country of ours. Uh, the SGU, would you please stand down up here? Come down here. Uh, okay. Bear with us. This is the first time that we are here, and we are honored that we are being asked to come here to be with you all, those who serve and those who did not serve as well. So, they are little, as you can see, <laughs> but they served. This gentleman here served when he was 12. And many of this served when they were between 10, 12, 15. They were children soldiers. But it was a war that they needed, they were needed to serve. The two purposes, they served to protect the sovereignty of our country then, Laos, the country of Laos. And then secondly, at the same time, simultaneously, as they were serving to protect the country of Laos, they served the interests of the United States. Okay, so two purposes at that time. And again, Phil has explained everything, what they did with the mountain yard, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, all this. These people were the ones who, if they heard what Bill or Phil said, that will make them either happy or sad. We lost 35,000 soldiers, the SGUs, 
They all have SGUs there. SGU means the special guerrilla units formed by the CIAs. Okay? Not in other not in any other country, only Laos. And only with the Lao and the Hmong in Laos during that war. These medals were not faked. I just want to let you know that they were given by the US Congress way back in 1995, the first time ever in our country of America for the government to recognize their service. In 1995, July 22nd, 20 years after we came to America. Again, they all have these medals because they served in the congressmen and the Congress of the United States. Award them with this medal. Uh, Thank you, Yang Chi. <laughs> Yang Chi, I, I see you have more. We're running out of time here. Yeah. If you, if and and I'd like to talk a little bit about the airplanes, but I just want you to know that these are the ones who serve on the ground. We have three stages. I'm going to stand up. Guerrilla unit, them. guerrilla war. Will you stand up and salute them? Conventional war and air war. So when we come to air war, I will let <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alan was will tell you, explain to you how sophisticated the T twenty eight was. All right. We lost three uh, we lost three hundred uh, seven hundred seven seven hundred twenty seven Americans with the Hmong during the Secret War in Laos. Thank, oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I got this. All right. So. Phil, I'm going to ask you a quick walk around. Can you just come up to your air airplane? It's, it's yours. It's been yours for a long time. We yes, already sir. talked about the name of it. But uh, anything, uh, it, it was developed, I, I think, you know, they went to Cessna and they said, hey, we need, uh, we need an airplane. And uh, Cessna at that time had a Cessna 170. Of course, it was side by side. And, uh, you know, they said, nah, that's not going to work. They turned into a, a, a tandem airplane and uh, put a little different motor in it. And it's a derivative, from what I understand, of the 170. Yes, it is. It's, uh, uh, the military needed a new liaison aircraft. They, they wanted an all-metal aircraft. They wanted one with a powerful engine. This has a Continental 0470-11B, 213 horsepower. Pulls this little airplane off the ground. It only weighs 2,100 pounds. And it carries 40 gallons of fuel and two people. And uh, you can pretty much see what it is. And I know time is a factor. So I did bring my exhibits out here uh, for people to read after we finish yakking. And then on the other, other window over there is a uh, specifications chart showing the performance specs of the aircraft. And you're more than happy to, to uh, read them and learn about the airplane. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn it over right now to Alan. And he's going to talk. He, uh, he, he didn't launch anything in anger off of uh, T-28, but he had everything to do with rebuilding that thing and flying that thing. So Thank you. Go so ahead. the T-28 here, much like Saigon T, is not an actual airplane that flew during the war. Uh, we painted it up as a memorial to the Hmong who operated this aircraft. A uh, couple things to notice on the tail is the emblem, the three-headed elephant to represent, represent the three tribes of Laos. Mm -hmm. Up on the tail, we have the SGU logo to help rep represent and commemorate our SGU members. And on the very top, we have put a black and white American flag to help symbolize the secret involvement of the U.S. in, in the war. Uh, so this airplane is powered by a RAT eight, uh, Wright 1820s, is 200 and I'm sorry, 1,425 horsepower, and. What this was originally uh, equipped with, with underneath the wings, they'd have rocket pods, bombs, and machine gun pods that the, the Hmong would go out and attack the Ho Chi Minh Trail with. So. And, and how much, uh, what was the acquisition? Where did it come from? So it was uh, purchased by the foundation. We're a part of the National Lao Hmong Memorial Foundation. We're trying to raise funds to build a memorial for the Hmong in Westminster, Colorado. And uh, we purchased the airplane out of uh, Minneapolis and restored it to look like th what they used in, in Laos. And so we're hoping to make this part of our display uh, very soon. 
Outstanding, outstanding. Well, thank you. And 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 just the uh, the the training that went the training to to be a Hmong pilot went on in in Laos, correct? Yeah. I mean, so everything w happened right there. Everything happened there. So they would bring in uh, pilots from the U.S. for the CIA to train pilots to Laos the, the Hmong members on actual missions. So your training was on an actual mission, and you would come back and then wow. you would train the next group of pilots. Outstanding. Well, thank you. Um, all right. Again, in the interest of time now, I'm going to open it up to questions. And uh, anything, any, uh, any, anything anybody wants to ask, uh, feel free. We're, uh, we're here. To, and if we know the answer, great. Uh, we got one over here in the corner. It sounds a lot similar to, uh, uh, well, for Phil, the question, uh, a ravens and the ravens in, in Laos. Were you, did you work with the ravens? I did not work with the ravens, but the ravens were doing what, what the SPAFs were doing. The ravens worked in northern Laos out of, uh, um, out of uh, Lima Site Alpha, which was um, Long Tien. They worked out of Long Tien. And it was a, it was a Steve Canyon program, CIA-backed. And, uh, and even the SPAF uh, program didn't have a normal chain of command. The CIA pretty much operated our, our, our operation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Some more questions. There's one up. Oh, wait a minute. Who's got uh, Oh, wait. We got one right down here. We'll get to you. What is the weight of the T-28? Weight of the T-28. Depends on how many bombs and weapons you have on it. Okay, yeah. uh, give us a ballpark figure. I, I, I think it, it can go up to like 85,000 or 8,500 pounds for takeoff. Yeah. All right. All right, we got another one up there. Go ahead. This particular T-28, can you tell us what model it is and what service it went to originally? All right. Yeah, so this is a, a T-28 Bravo and originally was used as a trainer in Pensacola. So originally a Navy airplane then? Navy huh? airplane, yep. Huh. Okay. Very good. All right. There's one down low here. Right. Uh, there he is. So I, oh, being down here a couple of years, I've learned a lot about Air America through Neil Hansen. Did, uh, did you guys interact with the Air America troops there too, or pilots? The only, inter the only interaction we had with Air America was after my tour. They came to our compound and uh, wanted to uh, hire us. Uh, and uh, I had a wife at home, and so I, I politely said no and, uh, and, uh, and went home. But uh, anyway, yeah, it would, have been, it would have been fun, I tell you. I'll volunteer to answer part of that as well. I, f I came down for fun one day, and I was at Benoit. This guy in civilian clothes walks up, and he says, calls me by name, and he like, says he'd like to talk to me. And so what he was doing is he was recruiting people uh, that were flying O-1s to go up and fly with the Raven Fax up in the northern port of Laos. Uh, I, only, I only asked him one question, and that was asking what his loss rate was. And he told me it was approaching 50%. And so I was interested in that characteristic because I, too, had a wife and three ch children. <laughs> and uh, so when he... He told me that answer, I asked him how he was suffering his losses. And the answer was, we own the top of the mountain. The bad guys own the bottom part of the mountain. And sometimes the bad guys try to get to the top. If they do, and you're asleep, they just cut your throat. Whoa. So I politely told that young man that I didn't think I was the guy he was looking for. And so he, he thanked me, and he left, and we were both happy. Wow. Wow. Uh, at the top. They offered me 10 grand as well, and I said no. I'm, I'm curious, Phil, what did you think was the most dangerous mission we flew out of all the different ones, in your opinion? Which one scared you the most? Well, you, you know the answer to that, right? It, it, was the, it was the Ford drum missions, the low-level photo missions. Um, it, they, were, they were scary. And, uh, you know, you, you flew, flew 10 to 50 feet off the ground, and uh, most of the time you, you went, went by your targets. Our observers were professional photographers. 
with motor-driven Pentax cameras. And uh, usually you would make one pass and they would, they would get their photos. And yeah, they would shoot at you and you could see the tracers going by and occasionally get hit. But uh, that's when your heart goes up into your throat. Okay. Another, no questions? I'll ask right now. Oh, we got we got one up there, right in the tan shirt. I noticed that um, bullet hole marked on your airplane by the footwell or your right foot. I was wondering what the story is behind that and how close it mi it missed you by. Well, that I, I didn't know. I didn't maybe put them in the exact right place. <laughs> But uh, they, they did not hit my feet. They didn't hit the observer's feet or anything. And uh, I also picked one, one up that went through the uh, uh, vertical, uh, the uh, shark fin antenna you see back there. And, and a couple went through the wing at one time or another. But like I say, we didn't get shot at a lot. And when they did shoot at us, as, as we had various techniques of, of, of flying in a, in a crab changing altitude, changing directions, skidding, slipping, doing whatever we had to to fool the gunners on the ground because they, with those 12.7s, they had those sights with the little airplane on it and they knew how to lead you. But if you had a little bit of flap down and you were flying at an off speed, usually they would, they would miss because they overled you. And I got to ask a question. I was a former FAC also briefly, and never a, a combat FAC by any means. But I flew the O2, and uh, and I'm I, in terms of shooting things and dropping things. And did you just like like take a grease pencil and, and put it on the board and, and put a dot out there and say okay? Uh, what was your aiming technique? Yeah, we had a very sophisticated sight on this airplane. <laughs> it was depending on the airplane we were flying and how tall you were and how far back your seat was adjusted. <laughs> You put a grease pencil mark on the airplane, maybe with an X through it, and that was, uh, that was how you uh, figured out how to sight in your rockets. And as Ed said earlier, we all had our techniques, and in flight school they teach you to, to, to do a 90 degree turn, come in at a 45 degree angle, and shoot your rockets. Well, that's so predictable that the enemy's going to get you. And so Frank and I, we would do wing overs, to, uh, to come in steeper. Sometimes I would pass the target completely, roll into a split S, and come down at about a 70 or 80 degree angle and punch a rocket because I'm not going to miss. I put a I put rocket uh, one time in a foxhole <laughs> and, and blew a couple of. But guys I'm not up. bragging, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean it happened, and you know you can if you if you coming down on it, you can hit it, and then you're going so fast, like Ed said before. When, when, you're, when you know there's people down there that are going to shoot at you, so when you're going fast after you made your rocket run, you can peel off any direction right above the treetops, and b by the time they've got a beat on you, you're gone. I understand. All right, I do this at most of my, uh, my presentations. I'll, uh, okay, last question. That's it. Really, it's not a question, but um, addressing to Red Marker and my Jade fact there, a lot of people don't understand pre-frag missions, they knew what ordnance or what aircraft and they were going to hit the targets. But some of the difficulty and the routes that they took for troops in contact that came up and they needed the additional air support. As the JFAC and Red Marker, he got his air support pretty fast out of Benoit or Fan Rang on that. But the SPAF and all, a lot of people don't know the route and the different organizations you had to go through before you finally got the approval and 7th Air Force to release those bombers to get to the guys that needed the target. And what does that mean? That means more time and more bot guys on the ground who could possibly die. I, I understand completely. All right, I'm going to ask now uh, veterans, period. All veterans, uh, stand up, please. We want to recognize it. And that includes the Hmong, please. Thank you all for your service, and we're going to wrap it up, and I'm going to say right now, thank you to these gentlemen. Anytime I can shake the hand of a thousand-hour combat pilot, 
uh, it is an honor for me. Thank so, you. Phil, Ed, and you guys, again, what you brought to the fight here is great. Yang Chi, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next program is uh, tomorrow morning. How to grow delicious tomatoes. Step one, feed them while watering with miracle Grow liquid feed. That's it. miracle Grow. all you need to know to grow. How to grow more vibrant flowers. Step one, feed them with miracle Grow Shake and Feed. That's it. miracle Grow. Mm. All you need to know to grow. How to grow delicious herbs. Step one, use miracle Grow Potting Mix. That's it. miracle Grow. All you need to know to grow. Today, we are pleased to announce that Warbirds in Review has received a generous donation of a beautiful Breitling Super Avi B04 Chronograph GMT46 tribute to the Vought F4U Corsair watch. Retracing the celebrated design codes of the Breitling Reference 765 Avi Copilot, the Breitling Classic Avi collection recalls Breitling's earliest ties with aviation from the 1930s onward when the brand was known for precision cockpit clocks and pilot chronographs produced by its Hewitt Aviation Department. The classic Avi pays homage to this unique heritage with a highly legible dial, rugged case, and signature rotating bezel that allowed pilots to measure some of the very first long-haul flights. Today, the collection celebrates the pioneering spirit of those early aviators along with four legendary airplanes the Curtis P-40 Warhawk, the de Havilland Mosquito, the Vought F-4U Corsair, and the North American P-51 Mustang. This amazing contribution will help Warbirds and Review continue to bring audiences our unique aviation programs that showcase history, heroes, and heritage together every summer. Every aircraft has a history and every pilot has a story. Why does it matter what happened long ago? The answer is that history is inescapable. It connects things through time and encourages us to take a look at those connections. History is the story of who we are, where we came from, and can potentially reveal where we are headed. The team at Warbirds and Review will be offering a very special opportunity to take home this rare timepiece with your tax-deductible contribution through a raffle or auction. Stay tuned. You know what this is? Scott's no quibble, money back, guarantee. If for some reason you're not satisfied, you'll get your money back, no quibbles, guaranteed. I mean, why? You wouldn't be satisfied with some of the best lawn care products on the market. I don't know. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, your bar for satisfaction is so high, it's almost unreachable. I'll track you down to understand what it takes to make you happy. Hypothetically speaking, of course. Feed it, Lord. Feed it.
I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Top Gun was really a thrill. I must have done well in actual combat because at the time I was just a lieutenant junior grade, which is a, a first lieutenant in the Air Force. And so I may have been the very first lieutenant junior grade to go through Top Gun. That was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot, just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. STS-27 was my, was my third launch, and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget we maneuvered the arm and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there and we brought up the television image of the right wing and I looked at what I was seeing and I said to myself, we are gonna die. To be an airline pilot, there was mandatory age 60 retirement. I was a NASA astronaut until I was 50 years old. And so I looked at the situation and I had known a number of Southwest airline pilots. And they were just like me. They were flying because they loved to fly. There's a lot of piloting that goes into it, a tremendous amount of piloting that goes into it because you're going to wind up passing other airplanes. You're, you're going to get in a duel with another airplane that's fairly closely matched. So there's a ton of satisfaction from, from doing that. And hey, let's just talk about the racing itself. It's fun to fly low but it's dangerous. It does it itself. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're right there with me, though.
Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid. North American Trainer Association, or NATA, is known for bringing warbirds together in a stunning showcase that celebrates human ingenuity and opens the world of military aircraft to future generations. It's the future generations that hold the power of these great birds in their hands, much like NATA member Garrett Fleischman. You're not just flying in the moment. You're flying with a whole bunch of history on your shoulders, and it really means a lot to fly them. Bridging history and the future, NATA supports those who remember when and future generations through clinics, scholarships, social media, and a world-class magazine. NATA is a resource for the entire Warbird community and it's open to anyone. Membership can get you access to history in a way you've never experienced before, on the ground and in the air. Without NATA's help through scholarships and regional clinics, the best and the brightest of aviation's future wouldn't have the opportunities they need to soar. I myself do not own a T-6, I do not have the resources to fly in big formation flights on my own, but joining an organization like NADA allows me to do this just because I'm motivated and eager to learn. The scholarships for future Warbird a and mechanics is a start, but it's the clinics that keep everyone up to date and provide the necessary training and type club support. And to keep the momentum going, there will be even more regional clinics and events in the future. These regional clinics offer an opportunity like no other to learn about flying warbirds in formation and to become a better pilot. We all share the same interest of being a better pilot, being a safer pilot, and being a uh, better formation pilot. join this organization and it's a constant learning process and and that's another thing that I love about it because a good pilot is always learning 
always. NETA membership isn't just for pilots, it's for everyone who loves aviation, past, present, and future. We have a lot of members that are not, uh, they're not even pilots. They love the fact that uh, the, uh, the airplanes still fly and they share the enthusiasm and the pride that's going on. It's a place where history comes to life, where the future is sparked by imagination and where aviation is more than just wings in the air. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. What else is it for? I was asked, you know, uh, where do I see NADA going into the future? And uh, I see uh, nowhere but up. Be a part of it. Join NATA today. STS-27 was my, was my third launch, and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm, and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there, and we brought up the television image of the right wing, and I looked at what I was seeing, and I said to myself, we are going to die. How to grow more vibrant flowers. Step one, feed them with miracle Grow Shake and Feed. That's it. miracle Grow. Mm. All you need to know to grow. How to grow delicious herbs. Step one, use miracle Grow Potting Mix. That's it. miracle Grow. All you need to know to grow. About a year ago, I met a gentleman called Walt Fricke, and they had a program called Veterans Airlift Command. 
And what the purpose of Veterans Airlift Command is, is predominantly hauling post 9-11 vets with um, severe bodily injury, uh, uh, post-traumatic stress uh, issues, things like that. I was a helicopter pilot and uh, was flying gunships when, uh, when I got wounded. Uh, we were leading a gun team and they were making a combat assault. The slicks are inbound with the troops. And uh, when we fired the, when he fired the rockets, one of the rockets exploded coming out of the tube. And the, the uh, shrapnel from the rocket took my foot, severed my foot, except for the Achilles tendon. Uh, my foot flipped up, and I grabbed my knee and my foot flipped up and landed backwards in my lap. And then uh, my crew chief, who had also taken shrapnel in the chest, unpinned the seat, laid it down, pulled off his belt and put a tourniquet on my leg, like a count of one, two, three. And he saved my leg. Uh, you know, I spent uh, six months in a hospital when I got back from Vietnam, uh, a long way from home. And uh, it was a, a while before my family could gather the resources to come and see me. And, and during that period of time, I was very anxious. I was losing weight uh, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, PTSD and, and uh, concern about how they'd view me with a busted up body, had a leg that, you know, we thought I was going to lose. And, and um, so that six weeks stayed with me. When I retired, I had an airplane, and I thought, you know, I can solve that problem for somebody. And I thought, well, I'll start this transportation service for combat wounded with my airplane. And, and a friend of mine challenged me and said, you can't keep this idea to yourself. It's, you know, you need to create a national network and do this, and with your connections and that sort of thing, you could probably succeed, in which we have. We have 2,500 volunteers that fly for us, and very few people fly only one mission. Once they do it, they sign up to do more. There are lifetime friendships created out of the flights. It changes their lives. I've never met a finer group of people. There's not a one of them that has this feeling sorry for themselves, or they don't have a chip on their shoulder about their condition in life. And, and uh, they're, every, everyone we've flown has just been exemplary, uh, nice young men. My, my favorite story of transporting a vet, I reached into the baggage compartment and I grabbed his backpack when we got him back home and his purple heart was attached to it and it was the first time I'd seen it during the whole trip. And I handed it to him, almost with tears in my eyes, and the young man set the backpack down and gave me a hug and said, Mr. Holt, I never in a million years would have believed I would have flown in a private jet, much less be able to sit in the front right seat on both legs. And he was so appreciative, it humbled me because he's thanking me for thanking him. We're high on compassion and low on red tape was my, sort of my beginning mantra that we're gonna build this so that it's easy for them to access, easy for our pilots to access. So we want a very simple, low overhead, clean, effective operation. I traveled to Walter Reed Brook Army Medical Center, the major touch home points hospitals, and walked the halls and met the families and the guys in their beds and said, when you get ready to go home, you call us because you don't need to go through fly commercial and go through the TSA and with a wheelchair or prosthetics or a traumatic brain injury or burn victim. They don't need to be hassled by the by the you know security if we've got somebody that's willing to fly them, which we do.
World War II changed the world forever and forever after. The Fagan Fighters World War II Museum of Granite Falls, Minnesota was created as a tribute to the men and women of the greatest generation whose incredible sacrifices during World War II won and preserved the freedoms we enjoy today. The Fagan Fighters World War II Museum is the dream, the creation, and the passion of the Fagan family of Granite Falls, Minnesota, Ron and Diane Fagan and their sons Aaron and Evan. We've taken on a mission to connect the latest generation with the greatest generation because these are events in our history that need to be remembered and in our case and in the case of young children they need to be introduced to and we feel they're very important and need to be preserved and that's what we're trying to do. The mission is to preserve the memory of the heroes of World War II promote patriotism in today's Americans, and inspire tomorrow's leaders to study and apply history's lessons. It's not enough that these beautiful airplanes are collected and restored. The Fagan Museum restores each of them to flying condition. I think with everything at the museum, having stuff operational is important because people get to see them, how they were used, and get to hear them start up, and it gives people a better perspective of what these machines were capable of and what they look like in the air. There are no markers, monuments, or visitor centers in the skies above Europe, the Pacific, or the China, Burma, India theaters of World War II. These airplanes are the monuments. They are timeless portals to the courage and deeds of those who gave their all to preserve all that we hold dear. When the museum's airplanes are not flying, they are displayed in three hangars, the trainer hangar, the fighter hangar, and the bomber hangar. World War II was a worldwide conflict, and unfortunately it's not being taught in our schools anymore. But history always has a tendency to repeat itself, so we got to educate the younger generations about World War II. So learn these experiences from the past so you can apply them in the future to help guide this country in the right direction. I know the buildings are built to last 250 years. The stories that are contained within these buildings will last just as long. We're connecting some of the battles. The only thing we can connect them with are the ground machines, which many people have a connection to rather than the aircraft. With the museum opening, I started looking into the military vehicles. Started with a deuce and a half. 